Ethiopia is considered a symbol of independence for the whole of Africa. Having always promoted the concept of Africanness and Pan-Africanism, the country is seen as a defender of African interests and heritage, which is perhaps why a group of scholars, authorities on black history, dignitaries, and prominent individuals from the United Kingdom have set out to establish the Global Black History, Heritage, and Education Center here in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And today we will be hearing more about that from the committee set up for the task. Hello and welcome to Diplomatic Insights, I'm Kidana Baina. In today's episode, we look into the Global Black History, Heritage and Education Center to be opened here in Ethiopia. We're going to be looking at it from different dimensions, including how it can bring people of a black heritage together, as well as promote the concept of pan-Africanism and strengthen African solidarity. Do stay with us. Thank you all very much for giving us the time today and availing yourselves. And I'm going to start us off by asking, you know, the Global Black History Heritage and Education Center. Now, it was in November 2021, I believe, that a decision was made to establish the center. And also in 2022, preparations had began. And now after the formation, we're, we're coming closer to the formation. And the visit from all of you is an indication of that. So before I go into the rest of of the concept, I want you to tell us a little more about the establishment of the center as well as the vision behind it. Let's hear a little more about that to start us off. Uh, what we've been doing to create the Global Black History Heritage and Education Center, uh, we have been holding events at the uh, Embassy of Ethiopia in London and we began our project more than two years ago. And essentially, the importance of London is that it's a very diverse city, especially a diverse city for black people from all over the world. So in London, we engaged black people from different African countries, not just Ethiopia, but also Eritrea, also Nigeria, Ghana, uh, Sierra Leone, um, Uganda, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, so we engaged a wide cross-section of people from Africa. Uh, even in our delegation, we've got two people from Zimbabwe. We also engaged people from different Caribbean countries, Trinidad, Jamaica, uh, uh, Dominica, etc., etc., etc. Moreover, we engaged black people who had flown in to some of our conferences uh, from uh, Amsterdam in Holland, uh, and those people were of black South American heritage. So we had a very large cross-section of people. And we engaged them with this idea of what do they think of creating a global black history, heritage and education center. The agreement was, yes, we should do this. The second question is, where should we do this? And there was a general agreement that since Addis Ababa could reasonably be called the capital of Africa, where there's access to the different embassies of the African nations in one place. Uh, the general agreement, even from the people from Eritrea, the general agreement was let, yes, Addis Ababa is where it needs to happen. So over the meetings, over the consultations, we engage the scholars, we engage the historians, we engage the activists to find out how they think a center of black history, education, heritage, and culture, what that should look like, what kind of content should go in. And our delegation here, we are representatives of those hundreds of activists, scholars, and historians who think that this is an excellent idea and we should make it happen. So essentially, the last two plus years, we have made our moves and including winning over the support of the Embassy of London. So the ambassador has given us total support. And also we engaged the former prime minister, Mr. Haley Mariam Dessalane, and he too has given us his support and blessing he even met with us on uh, 22nd of June uh, last year. 
Thank you uh, for that answer. And when you answer that, actually, I heard you touch something on why Addis Ababa or Ethiopia as a whole was chosen for a center. And it's seen now, this initiative can be seen as something that is based on the potential of Ethiopia to safeguard and exhibit the history of Africa as well as all black people. So what I want to know now is actually what I want you to describe more is why Ethiopia was chosen and the sentimental of uh, reason behind why Ethiopia has been chosen as a center for the establishment of this initiative. My name is Adele Mohammed and I'm an educator and so for me being involved in the Global Black History and Heritage Education Center was of great importance um, because I watched how our youth across the world, our black youth in particular across the globe, Africa and the diaspora have seen their heritage, their culture, their knowledge slowly being diluted, distorted and misrepresented and I could see the need for such a centre to allow them to restore, reclaim and relearn about who they are and who they were and who they could be. And so for me, um, why Ethiopia? Why Addis Ababa? Well, we know that Ethiopia globally is recognised as the cradle of humanity and with that comes being the centre and the creation of civilization. And so that means they're the founders of education, the founders of learning, the founders of science and engineering, uh, philosophy, governance and all of those things and the founders of history in itself. And so for me that was an important um, very important factor that this is the heart of humanity and therefore for me it became the centre point for all education and reigniting uh, a new renaissance of empowerment um, and excellence for our young um, black youth. And what we do know about Ethiopia is it continues to be a world beacon as the only African nation and therefore Addis Ababa the only African um, capital city that was never colonised. And that shows the world, um, um, the African world, it shows the dis diaspora, it shows even poor and disadvantaged nations in the world, that when you put aside your differences and you unite, um, um, you can create um, an environment and unity where you don't give up and you don't give in. And as a result of that, Ethiopia has shown us as an African people across the world, and it's shown the world itself, that it is the place where all our history, our artefacts, our objects, our resources can be safely held and safely protected and be kept true to what they are. So we no longer have to um, rely on other people telling us what our history or culture should look like. We are now able not to recreate it, but give back the truth of our history and culture to the young people, to ordinary people around the world, and even to those people who still don't wish to accept the greatness of who we are and what we have done. And this education centre brings together our youth under one place, whether that's physically in the space of Addis Ababa or online in this education, where they can talk together, share together, understand their similarities and differences, recognise who they are, and from knowing who they are and what they've done, know who they can be. So for us here in this delegation, this team here, um, there is no other place but Addis Ababa here in Ethiopia as the beacon for, for liberation, for freedom, and for not giving in, um, and not giving up, and not allowing themselves to be beholden to, to anyone else. And that's what our young people need to see, and that's why the centre needs to be here. All right, so now you've talked about bringing the young people together and forming that solidarity. And where I'm going with this now is when we talk about heritage, we all know that you know, in general, the past and also her uh, heritage can be a source of hostility in terms of remembering um, a bad past. But now, in recent years, we're seeing a lot of black people come together, especially the past couple of years where Ethiopia was under pressure. We've seen the diaspora and a lot of the black people come together for a cause. And now I want to look at the importance of this center in terms of, you know, bringing solidarity among people who share the same heritage and who share the same history. Let's look at that now. My name is Andrew Mohammed. I'm a proud member of this mission and um, the youth are always going to be at the center of this initiative, this mission, because um, a great man once said a people without the knowledge of their history, their culture and their origin is like a tree without any roots. They both die. And so for our young people to attain the greatness that they are, they've got to know their roots. They've got to have their understanding. It says in the scripture, people die because of the lack of knowledge 
And so therefore, education, and especially the education amongst our youth, is absolutely fundamental. I remember as a young man trying to find who I, who I was, I read a fantastic book called The Wonderful Ethiopians of the Kushite Empire. It was written by a fantastic author in America, um, Drusilla Houston, in 1926. And that was my first introduction into Ethiopia. And I was blown away as a young man reading this book. And I thought, how many other young people are growing and not knowing that they are Ethiopian, not just by their passport, but by their blood, as we say. And um, it's by understanding that, that it's changed my life forever. And so I've always wanted to be committed to um, inspiring, engaging, and reconnecting our youth worldwide. And it's about that pan-African approach. And being on this visit, is, I, I, I've seen quite evidently it has to be here in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, because you don't just talk pan-Africanism, you live it, you eat it, you walk it, you see it. And so we need to introduce this to all the Ethiopians, even if those who may not know they're Ethiopian, but we need to introduce this true pan-African um, approach and ideology and way of life um, that they can touch, they can see, they can smell. And um, this center is dedicated to that re-education process. And so, as I've quoted before, and my co colleagues have actually quoted, that uh, the young people must be at the forefront of this initiative, and we must give that rebirth into Pan-Africanism. And my last point is this, is that what we've understood based on this trip and in my studies is that Pan-Africanism should always be a, a symbol of black excellence. And so our young people must be introduced to black excellence at the highest level. And once again, this whole project, this whole mission is introducing black excellence internationally to our people. And it has to be at the center of black excellence, which is Ethiopia. Okay, thank you. So now going, scaling it up, scaling up the relation or the solidarity that it could create, let's go to nations now. We've looked at how it can bring solidarity among people, but bringing it up to diplomatic relationships or overall co cooperation between nations of a somewhat similar history or a similar heritage. Now, what sort of role would the center play in terms of bringing about solidarity among African nations on the international arena, perhaps in dealing with, uh, you know, matters of, of international concern? Uh, the whole purpose of this center is to serve not only one country, to serve entire countries from the continent, that is Africa, and entire global black diaspora. So, how it does. The, one of the activities and the purpose is, one, to reclaim, reestablish, and recollect all African artifacts which were looted, given as a gift, everywhere throughout the world, in the kitchen, in the, souvenir, in the souvenirs, in the big museums, we want them to bring here, irrespective of which country. These days, if we see the, the hurdles that individual countries are facing when they are trying to reclaim their, their looted artifacts from museums around the world, it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. They say they own it. Only countries with strong diplomatic presence can probably gain back, regain back their products. So this institution will work as a central focus to do this thing, not only for one country, for all nations. That is one thing. This. In, when it comes to diplomatically, you know, when, when it comes to diplomacy, in relevant issues, which is to be voiced throughout the, throughout the world, this country will 
play us a voice because we believe that the existing recorded history, the world history portrays the role of African people as it, on, on, as it only starts from slavery, you know, that where our, our history starts. So we are strongly claim and believe that there should be clear uh, ratification and a clear correction of recording history on the, based on the evidence. That's another way. This means diplomatically also it reaches out each and every country. This country is unique and it qualifies to host, to own, not for itself, for the entire Africa and for the entire black people. We have, Ethiopians have tradition of maintaining old ancient artifacts. Ethiopians had the tradition of setting up global institutions, just to mention the African Union. And Ethiopians has tradition in the maintaining of institutions that are of far-reaching consequence across the generation. Therefore, we believe that we qualify, and not me believe, everybody here. They claim, they believe, like me, our blood is Ethiopia. Yes, in several different interviews, conversations, discussions, they reconfirm it, and they know, nobody taught us, we are representatives of Ethiopia, meaning we are representatives of Africa and representatives of the black people. And also, when it comes to diplomacy, it is very important that we have to embrace with renewed approach our brothers and sisters who are voices of Ethiopia there beyond yonder in the Caribbean. We have to think of our brothers and sisters. We have to take our diplomatic product to these people and we have to work with them. So that is what this institution means and this is, that is what this institution uh, for. So uh, it is, it's really a beacon of, of, of black excellence. That's what we are looking for. We want to be at the height of, you know, what is, what is what the, what the height of, you know, humanity that is resembling the creator. Nothing more, nothing less. We are resembling the creator. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I'm going to go back to the concepts of Pan-Africanism that you raised. But what your answer got me thinking now in terms of heritage and the stolen heritage, our colonial past has seen a lot of African countries' heritage being taken to the countries of former colonizers, which they, where they still remain. And I want to look at it now from this perspective of reestablishing or soothing over our relationship with um, former colonial powers. Number one, I want to look at it from the perspective of bringing back these stolen artifacts or heritage and number two I want to look at it in the in the idea or in the phase of how the center can sort of help us move past that colonial era and reestablish or soothe relations with former colonial uh, powers the way we are looking to proceed at the global black history heritage and education center will be ways of First of all, tracking where the artifacts are with a view to uh, having replicas done here. That would be the initial step. So the colonial powers will hold on to the artifacts. We then have the replicas. That would be the first step. But that won't be our final step because ultimately we want to swap that around so that the colonial powers have the replicas. We have the real ones here. So some civilizations, such as Benin, on a modern map, Nigeria, almost all of the fantastic Benin bronzes of the 15th and 16th centuries, almost all of them have been looted, and almost all of them are in London, Paris, Stuttgart, and so forth. So clearly, uh, what the people of Benin have right now are the replicas. They don't have the originals. 
Uh, Sky News uh, did contact me to ask my opinion on one of the London University, excuse me, Cambridge University colleges returning a single artifact, and that was a big news event. Now, one artifact, that's better than zero artifacts, but it does mean that something like 2,000 Benin bronzes are still held captive in other people's museums. So the idea then is European countries do have the wealth and they do have the technology to do the replicas with a view to the replicas staying in Europe and the originals coming to Africa and we want to play our role in that. We also want uh, where African countries have originals and they want to hold on to their originals, fine, we want the replicas to be in the Global Black History Heritage and Education Center. So let me explain the kind of heritage I'm talking about. When the people of Ethiopia were building the city of Yeha, the Temple of Al-Makar and so on, there's a fine corpus of art that women in Nigeria were creating called the Knox Sculptures. Now, Obviously, the Knox sculptures are going to be in Nigeria. Some of them are being looted as we speak by people in Switzerland. Yeah, I'm watching you. People in Switzerland are doing that right now. Yeah, but the point being that the ones that we can identify, certainly we want to reclaim them from the looters in places like Switzerland, and we would want replicas of the ones in Nigeria here so that people can see this. And we want to duplicate this idea across the different African civilizations. So it's not just, uh, as Brother Segai says, about the diplomatic relations between different African countries and between Africa and its diaspora. We also want a situation where every black person knows the history and heritage of every other black person. And that's important because as I travel across different African countries, a lot of people know their own heritage, but they don't know anybody else's. So you'll get a situation that people in Ethiopia know that in the 12th century, you're all responsible for carving churches out of the ground in Lalibela. At the same time period, a, a black woman from the deserts of the Sahara set up a university in Timbuktu, the University Mosque in Timbuktu. So just as Ethiopia has got manuscripts, Timbuktu has got manuscripts. Hausaland has got manuscripts. Sudan has got manuscripts. The Swahilis have got manuscripts. All of these things are common heritage. Same thing, same thing when Lalibela was being built in or carved in Ethiopia. You had castles being built in the Zimbabwe region, the great Zimbabwe Acropolis. At the same time period, coins from the Tanzanian city of uh, Kilwakisiwani were discovered in Australia. That made British national news. Do you see? So these, these are the kinds of heritage. And then once we now know, well, this is what Ethiopia was doing. This is what another group of people were doing. This is what another group of people were doing. That now builds mutual respect between black people. And that's very, very important. And similarly, we have to bring in the, the, the contributions of enslaved people. The people that ended up in the Caribbean, the people that ended up in North America, the people that ended up in South America. Um, there was a, a study that you know, uh, I was looking at about, for example, in England, there's something called ballroom dances. And the ballroom dances, you've got the Paso Doble from Spain, you've got the waltz from Vienna, you've got the polka from Czechoslovakia. All the others were invented by enslaved blacks. So you have the ones in America, the, 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 the bunny hug, that became the foxtrot. You had the ones in Brazil, that became the samba. You had black people in Buenos Aires, that became the tango. You had black people in uh, Cuba, 
that became the habanera, which then became the rumba. And so we can trace all of this heritage to enslaved people bringing African dances to the West, and then those dances ending up as ballroom dances. And that kind of intangible heritage also needs to be included in the Global Black History Heritage and Education Center. So now going back to the idea of Pan-Africanism that I was going to raise earlier, I want to look at how or what significant role this center will play in terms of promoting the ideals of Pan-Africanism, which is growing strong among many African youth and a lot of black people across the world. So let's talk about the this uh, global uh, black center in terms of promoting or embracing the ideals of uh, Pan-Africanism. So I'll start on that answer from the educational um, perspective. Um, what we don't want to happen with Pan-Africanism, what we notice with us in the diaspora because of our history, that Pan-Africanism often is an add-on. It's more of a protest movement. And what we need to do is to move our young people away from that protestant way of um, addressing Pan-Africanism to a more Ethiopian view of Pan-Africanism, as my brother Andrew was talking about. So it becomes a part of who they are, and they're not fearful of who they talk to or how they talk about it, because there's still significant repercussions within the, across the diaspora when we talk about Pan-Africanism itself. So it is a sensitive area that we have to to prepare our young people for in a very sensitive way because we know young people are vibrant and they're very energetic and they need the guidance of um, older and more mature um, members of the community to let them see how they can best engineer and navigate um, Pan-Africanism to their advantage and um, where they are and how they can look to Africa and the different um, states within Africa how Pan-Africanism um, has worked. So that process has to start because it's not within our education system system. African history is not even within the education system, so all the education for our young people is through the family and through the community. And a lot of our older members of the community have lost touch with Pan-Africanism. So it's an area that we as the Global Black History and Heritage Education Centre have to be looking at how we are going to prepare our elders and our young people for, for that journey. So I'd like to hand over, if you don't mind, to Brother yes. Andrew, because I know he is very um, committed to the whole Pan-African movement and he has a view on how we take this sensitive journey for the diaspora and bring it home. And thank you so much um, for that um, Lady Adele and that's a beautiful question sister. Um, we sometimes underestimate the power of the youth around the world and um, it was just a few years ago during the so-called lockdown um, period that um, our youth was crying out Black Lives Matter and just by that unified voice of black youth coming together and saying that black lives matter, it literally affected every government around the world, especially in the diaspora. Um, I see the black lives matter cry as a stepping stone to Pan-Africanism. They don't appreciate what they're saying when they say black lives matter. That is just step one. And if we can introduce uh, to the young people around the world the true history and the true glory of Pan-Africanism, then you will see that there will change from Black Lives Matter to that Africa matters, yes. that we matter, that we are the cornerstone of everything that we see in technology, science, chemistry, whatever it may be, agriculture. And so Pan-Africanism must be introduced in a, as a living, vibrant, concept for our young people and we then move from pan-africanism to the next stages um baba sagai was saying that pan-africanism pan-africanism becomes symbolic of black excellence because when we study ethiopian history to me when i see the artifacts and i see the monuments and i see the historical efficacy of ethiopia it was african excellence black excellence when i study the ancient um, history of Kemet, which we today call Egypt, that was symbolizing black excellence. When we look at the pyramids, when we look at the temples, when we look at the, um, the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the, um, uh, of the Queens in ancient Kemet, you're looking at black excellence. That is Pan-Africanism. When we look at the Moorish empire uh, of the Black Moors, the Moors that left from North Africa and civilized the whole of Europe, which they call the Renaissance period, 
For 700 years, Africans ruled Europe. We gave them the concept of parks. We gave them the concepts of universities. We gave them the concept of mathematics. That's why they call it Arabic numerals today. That was a sign of black excellence. When we look at the Caribbean, and we look at the movement right across the Caribbean in terms of Nanny of the Maroons and what have you, okay, they were building black excellence. And so if we can introduce the true spirit of um, Pan-Africanism to the youth, it will change the world. And my last point is this, is that by meeting some of the great living people here in Ethiopia, I speak especially of our excellency, um, Madam Mia um, Adenich, she, just studying her life, you're looking at Pan-Africanism in motion. Yep. Um, her life, I personally believe, should be a movie for young people to study. And, um, you know, from a, young, as, from a young lady, from a young girl, she was self-taught. And she had led, she's literally led the way of being the first woman in many assets and facets of her life. That, to me, is Pan-Africanism in action. And I believe with the global black heritage, the Global Black um, History and Heritage Education Center, we want to be at the forefront of black excellence to the young people. Now we're seeing an era of neo-colonialism in, in many forms. And so what I want to talk about as a final point to our uh, discussion for today is an explanation as to how this center can help this generation of black people get out of the clutch of this neo-colonialism that we're currently facing. The way forward to challenge neo-colonialism is by our ability to build wealth and that's very very important now how does our center help that let me show how um, a study was done in October 2012 to establish who was the richest individuals throughout recorded history and they got economists and scholars to work out who were these people. And then the results were in. At number two stood the Rothschild dynasty. The Rothschild family, the banking family. At number one, the richest person in history was Mansa Musa I, the medieval ruler of Mali. And they estimated his wealth uh, in English pounds, it came out as 249 billion, and in American dollars, it came out as 400 billion. And so, the question is, how did he do it? What were the strategies that he used to amass that kind of fortune? And consequently, the question now becomes, how do we use those ideas to build wealth today, and how do we inspire our young people? Now, if you speak to African Americans, it is well known that the first African American uh, millionaire was a woman called Madame C.J. Walker. But then I found out, as I dug deeper, that they've misrepresented the information. Do you see? They misrepresented it. So they say, Madame C.J. Walker was the first uh, African-American millionaires. This is what they should have said. I checked this. It's in the Guinness Book of World Records. She's not the first African-American millionaires. She's the first millionaires. Full stop. Not African-American, not American, globally. And so what happened is, is that site was reported, but it, it then ended up being misreported. Now, if you consider Madame C.J. Walker came, was one generation out of slavery. Her parents were slaves. And she now amassed so much wealth. What, what's also interesting about Madame Walker as well is that there's a building that she had in the city of Indianapolis. Uh, they call it the Madame C.J. Walker Building. And it's an example of modern African art deco with Moorish designs, 
Egyptian designs and design factors from other parts of Africa. And this is what somebody one generation away from slavery was able to do. So the lesson then for our young people is can you emulate and do better than Mansa Musa? Can you emulate and do better than Madame Walker? And that becomes the way that if you can outbid your colonizers, you can stop them. Because how colonizers work is if you've got more money than the president of a country, you can bribe that president. You can get that president to do something that is anti their people. If your people are richer than the people who are trying to bribe you, you can stop that from happening. On the contrary, we can start corrupting the, no, you don't even want to hear that. <laughs> you don't even want to hear that. So yeah, we can even, we can put a stop to their nonsense. Let's just put it like that. Thank you very much for that answer. And also thank you all so much for giving us your time and availing yourself today. Thank you for the insights and we really appreciate it. Thank you so much once again. Thank you. With that, we end today's Diplomatic Insights. We've looked into the formation of the Global Black History, Heritage, and Education Center here in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. We've looked at it from the perspective of how it can promote the ideals of Pan-Africanism, as well as what it could do for the diplomatic relationship for people of a black heritage. I was Kirana Baina leading you through the program. Until next time. <laughs>